Hello, Stuart. Welcome to Time Team. Very nice to see you again. Mm -hmm. And uh, this program, it was fascinating in a way, wasn't it? That for me, it represented the, this huge structure from the past, a medieval castle, this substantial building. We have a, an illustration of it. We have maps and all the rest of it. And we're sat there with the well that was in the middle, and that's in the middle of this park. But the struggle to find it was pretty amazing. <laughs> and the struggle that you had also to look for the medieval town and put the two things together. And it was quite an example of a persistent uh, struggle to try and get what we could from it. W what are your memories of the site? The heat is the first thing I remember. It was, it was baking hot. But the, the really exciting for me, that thing for me, Tim, was being able to look at a town like Queenborough. And, and it's, it's a well-preserved medieval town. It wasn't at all what I expected when I got there. Um, and the layout of the medieval town was obvious in all the burgage plots and the layouts you get with medieval towns and the harbour at one end, and there should have been a castle at the other end. So you know, it, it, was, it had to be there. The question was kind of what did it look like and, and what were all the intricacies of it? But for me, it was like pulling, pulling apart a medieval town. The castle was just one, one part of that, that, that exploration. And I always like the fact that when we have Jonathan Foyle on the shows, who's normally, his, his day job is the royal palaces, and we end up sticking him down a cellar of a house. <laughs> and I like those little moments where you and he were trying to find the stonework from the medieval village underneath the Victorian Georgian houses. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Like I suspect on the programme, we only saw maybe one or two cellars that I went down. But I went down many, I, I can assure you. I mean, we went down one, and there's this incredible wine cellar down there, Tim. You would have loved it. Racks and racks, cobwebs, dust. It's like something out of a film. You know, I could have spent the, could have spent the three days down there. If I, if I, <laughs> I went in another cellar with a, with a chap, and it was flooded. It was like going into an underground swimming pool. And, and I, I said to him, oh, you've got a leak. So I said, oh, it's always like that. You know, it's kind of, I thought, fancy living above that. But the, the, the key to medieval towns, obviously, when you look at the, the footprint of the buildings above ground, you could see there were the, the frontages, some of them preserved, of medieval burgage plot widths, about five metres. And from experience, I've learned that if you ignore all the later frontages on the buildings and get down below ground where there are cellars, you often see the original medieval cellars and walls underground and exactly what, what, what happened. And as you say, drag Jonathan down into areas he probably doesn't like going into. Not, not polite enough. <laughs> I like the fact as well that, that you know, this was a, a considerable um, bit of... Um, uh, sort of one-off building structure, really. I mean, Edward III wanted to provide this for his queen, Philippa, and he wanted the town, the castle, the defensive location on the port. And things began to sort of come together a bit for me when we finally got that very interesting illustration, which um, I think a local person provided for us, a local historian came up with it, we didn't know it existed before the program. And you had this vision of this rather French looking mm. castle. But the big problem that you and John and Phil and everybody had to sort out was this sort of circular orientation of something. Uh, we had the plan, but it was difficult <laughs> to find out what was in, what was out, where everything was. Yeah, that, there's some some peculiar aspects to that, which which even now I I, I, can't, I can't quite why work out why it took us so long to get to grips with it at times. But the 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 let first of all the layout of the town with the medieval high street from the harbour. There's only one street in, in Queenborough, and it was, should have led straight to the main to the main gate. So why we debated about whether it was east or west, you know, I, I, I can't remember why, why that sort of got lost in translation, because the main entrance 
would have been facing right onto the high street. So in a way that, that puzzles me a bit why we, we played around with that. And the other aspect of that was that the green space it, that you have there today, you could still see the earthwork, very slight, but you could still see the earthwork of, of the moat, which was a big ditch on the outside of it. So in essence, we had really should have known exactly where the main gate was, and you had the moat which defined the outside of it. So, you know, it had to be in there, <laughs> yeah. however deep it was, and however much had been robbed out and taken away, it had to be in that, that space. We have come across this before, Stuart, in the context of other jobs that um, Cromwell's commissioners have done. I'm thinking of palaces by the River Thames and things like that. But when you see a massive structure like that, which is virtually disassembled and removed block by block, and we're left with the mortar infilling. I think uh, Oliver Crichton, was it from Exeter, described it as crisp packet um, mm. or cornflake packet mm. architecture, where you have structure on the outside, I think it was Jonathan, and the inside is all this core of rubbishy kind of lime together. But considering that huge structure, apart from that well stone, um, you know, there was it took a while for various things to come out, didn't it? Mm. Oh, it's quite incredible. And I've seen it any number of times. And I'm sure you have too, that sometimes you just take the turf off and things are perfectly preserved. And other times, you, you know, you can keep going down and down and down and the evidence tells you it was there, but it's been taken away. And, and all the nicely dressed stone that was there. Um, not only is it sort of knocked down, knocked down after, the, you know, after the Civil War, but the stone, the good stone's taken away. You can reuse it elsewhere. You know, it's, it's like recycling. And all you get left with is this sort of rubbish mortar and bits of broken stone that's left. But it, it didn't surprise me. I know we got to near the end, and I remember we had a bit of a debate on camera, I think, about... Uh, you know, th there was no evidence, you know, it couldn't couldn't be within that 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 shape and that size we we're looking at. And again, well, it had to be. <laughs> uh, it just had to be. So the evidence said it was. There. And I think right at the end, if I remember rightly, uh, Phil down with his core and going through all this stuff where he was, oh, well, it can't have been there. And he found some mortar right at the bottom with his core to show that even another metre, two metres down, there was still evidence of, of probably the cellars that went with that castle. I thought it was a lovely moment. And a couple of unusual things, uh, just a, a final couple of memories about it. I, I rather sympathised with Raisan, um, <laughs> who he, he used his architectural skills to make a repeated number of variation models on a theme. And, and each time we sort of came back and said, no, no, that's no good, start again. And, and eventually he was able to get there. And also the bizarre, and I, and I think this must have been um, a director, producer, somebody decided to have a, have a bit of whimsicality to make a paper boat. <laughs> I, I, I remember that was the, um, I think that, that that was the, f I never actually even saw that boat, Tim. You know, too busy doing other things. I went out on the real boat, out onto, into the estuary, which, which, which was great out there. Like an eccentric John Taylor, and uh, the researchers have been doing, obviously, a good job with nothing else to think about, about castles, and managed to find this chap who created this paper boat, and, and uh, various things about it, which we won't tell you about. It, it's a sort of fascinating study. Yeah. God knows what it's got to do with castles. I don't know. But anyway, it was a nice <laughs> time team whimsicality. If you were advising someone to watch this, and what would be a reason you think it's a good programme to watch? I think it's a good, good programme because there was a lot of uncertainty about something you felt should be very obvious that, that, that for me in a way I mean there's a town there's a street there's a big sign that says here was a castle here the maps say castle was there here are some drawings of it, it uh, and yet how difficult it is to unravel something you think is going to be obvious and then the excitement at the end in finding not only was it all full of nice symmetrical curves like a flower 
which isn't what most castles are like. It, as you say, it had these sort of like chateau-like turrets on them, almost like a, a, a castle flowering at the end of the programme from, from starting off with a bit of green space. I love that aspect of it. Good. So um, that's um, a fascinating thing, really, wasn't it? The, 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 the obviousness of the structure from the medieval past and how those structures after hundreds of years can gradually kind of dissolve back. So Queensborough on the Isle of Sheppey is, is a fascinating program because of this and well worth seeing if the paper boat actually makes it across the <laughs> river at the end. So Stuart, thank you very much for having a chat about that and uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. Pleasure Tim. can't do any of this work without you so please subscribe back us on patreon and make sure that time team comes back again